Welcome everyone to the panel on algorithmic fairness and social justice. Um, this is an Ingram Olkin series uh, forum, part of a series. Um, we'll hopefully have some more panels coming up on algorithmic fairness and social justice. Um, the National Institute of Statistical Sciences, or NIST, has organized the Statistics Serving Society series to honor the memory of Professor Ingram Olkin who um, served as principal founder of NIST and is an internationally recognized statistician who, whose work stressed the importance of statistical thinking in studying major societal problems. So there are several goals affiliated with Ingram Open Forums and I just wanna go over them briefly. Uh, the first is to bring innovations in statistical methodology and data science into new research and public policy collaborations. The second is to work to accelerate the development of innovative approaches that impact societal problems. We also hope to provide statisticians with an understanding of the societal problems and stimulate their interests. Lastly, uh, we develop statistical action items to better inform public policy and to generate reliable evidence to mitigate the problem. And we hope to accomplish all of these by facilitating new collaborations among statisticians and those working to understand and mitigate the problem. So our inaugural IOF was um, in 2019 on gun violence. Uh, this was an in-person forum before the world of COVID where we looked at emerging data sources, gun violence trends, um, assessing gun violence risks and evaluating initiatives as well as other topics. Um, we're in the planning process of organizing additional IOFs on opioids and there's an ongoing IOF happening right now on unplanned clinical trial disruptions due to COVID. Um, so yeah, this one, as I said, is on social justice. In particular, we're interested in criminal justice and healthcare as well as other applications. Um, and we will possibly have upcoming um, IOFs in this series on algorithmic fairness in combinations with things such as education and finance. I'm, I'm so excited for this panel today. We have three great panelists. The first will be Kush Varsity, who's a distinguished research staff member and manager at IBM Research. The second is Christian Lum, uh, assistant professor of computer and information science at the University of Pennsylvania. And then finally, Alexandra Childachova, who's, who's an assistant professor of statistics and public policy at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so that's our ordering for today. Each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes. Um, we have left plenty of time for discussion. We really hope these IOFs will be participatory, so we really hope that you'll participate in our discussion. Uh, we've asked the panelists to all keep their remarks relatively brief so that you all can participate in discussion at the end. We hope that you'll stay on mute throughout the presentations, um, but then raise your hand at the end to indicate that you have a question if you do. Um, you can also use the chat box to answer, to ask any questions throughout the talk, um, and we'll try to moderate them as they come in. Um, if you could also rename yourself on the Zoom window, um, this sort of serves as a virtual name tag so we can see um, who you are. Um, yeah, so some logistics, I'm sure we're mostly used to Zoom at this point, um, but some logistics, um, Glenn Johnson and Megan Glenn are our hosts for this session. Um, I would recommend that you turn your view to speaker view um, so that you can see the speakers while they're giving their, their talk. Um, and then on, uh, after this session is over, you'll receive an evaluation form and we would really appreciate if you could fill out the evaluation form as they're very helpful to NIST. And a link to the recording of the session will be available after the session. So with that, I'd like to thank you for again for coming. I'm really looking forward to this session. Um, and I'm really grateful for the work of the organizing committee, which consists of Jerry Sachs, uh, myself, Michael Brendage, Vijay Nair, and Nancy Flournoy. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Kush. If you are ready to go, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, so let me try sharing my screen. All right, uh, is everyone able to see my screen? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to give some uh, brief remarks uh, on trustworthy machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, 
So first, just to start off uh, very briefly, I wanted to uh, tell you all about uh, IBM Research uh, AI, which is our um, uh, the part of IBM Research that uh, is looking to advance the field of uh, AI from narrow to broad. So we have kind of these three sort of um, uh, it's concentric or however you want to call it, um, sort of uh, directions uh, advancing AI. So um, Kind of generally improving uh, how machine learning and uh, more classic AI uh, works in, uh, in the normal ways. And then um, thinking about trusting AI, so making it fair, explainable, robust, transparent, and so forth. And then um, uh, thinking about scaling it to um, uh, uh, various parts of the, the life cycle. Okay. Uh, so our focus right now is uh, on the trust aspect, um, which is what I work on. Um, so we're seeing throughout uh, various sort of businesses and industries that um, uh, that tr trust is essential in all of these critical workflows, whether it's loan processing or hiring and firing and promotion decisions, uh, customer management, quality control, and so forth. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why um, these uh, this trust is becoming a top uh, priority for uh, various sort of companies. Um, so one is uh, making sure that they uh, maintain their brand reputation. Another is that uh, they're uh, dealing with increased regulation um, in various sort of uh, fields. Uh, there's an increase in complexity of AI deployments and uh, especially now um, there's a huge focus on social justice. Um, and uh, we, well, we might wanna ask, I mean, what does it take to trust a decision made by a machine? Um, so the first thing that you really do need um, from a machine learning system is that it is accurate. Uh, you don't want something that just doesn't work. Uh, so that's clearly the case, but um, then there's many other considerations beyond accuracy that uh, become important. So um, is it fair? Uh, did anyone tamper with it? Is it accountable? Um, is the pipeline sort of transparent and uh, can I understand how the machine makes its predictions? So all of these are some of the things in addition to um, basic accuracy that one needs when uh, trying to um, uh, build a trustworthy machine learning system. Okay. And we'll be focusing mostly on fairness um, and uh, have this interesting quote from one of the early CEOs of IBM, uh, Thomas J. Watson Sr. Um, uh, so he said, the toughest thing about the power of trust is that it's very difficult to build and very easy to destroy. So uh, let's take the difficult road and think about how we can build up um, the trustworthiness of machine learning and uh, especially on the fairness aspects. Okay. Uh, so the parts, the I mean, the thing that I want to focus in on is kind of this life cycle of developing machine learning technologies and systems. Uh, so the image that you see is a representation of kind of a workflow or life cycle with various phases, as well as various personas that are involved in, um, uh, in doing those uh, parts of the problem. Uh, so there's a problem owner, a data engineer, a data scientist, a model validator, and an AI operations engineer. Um, the data scientist is involved in um, many of the, uh, the steps. Uh, so starting with problem specification, going to data understanding, data preparation, and modeling. Um, and uh, the data scientist works with the problem owner um, and a data engineer in, in doing these. And then there's a model validator who is often independent and uh, deployment or operations engineer um, at the end. And one thing that I've drawn on here, which um, might not always be the case in every sort of workflow is um, uh, the inclusion of diverse stakeholders as another persona um, to, to be looking at. Okay. Um, and this is actually um, a well-known sort of uh, flow. It's called the CRISP-DM uh, methodology of doing data mining. Uh, so it's almost that. Uh, so I wanted to take you through a particular example um, uh, to make this more real and kind of point out some things that relate to um, fairness and justice um, uh, as we go along. And I'll focus um, primarily on the problem specification and uh, data understanding and uh, data preparation parts and uh, touch on modeling very briefly. Um, okay. Uh, so there's this uh, concept of uh, pay-as-you-go solar power. Um, so the idea is that if you live in a place where 
either you don't have grid access um, or the grid access that you have um, gives you very little um, uh, power per day, so just like two or three hours per day, um, then you might want to have a solar panel uh, on your roof to um, uh, let you have your cell phone or um, uh, run your fans and lights and so forth. Okay. Um, so a lot of people are in a situation where they can afford um, a solar panel if it was uh, made more available through a, a better financing scheme because uh, they can afford small amounts of kerosene and other things like that, um, uh, but uh, they don't have all the capital at any one point to afford a full uh, solar panel system. Uh, so what pay as you go solar power um, does is it takes a very small down payment, let's say like five or ten percent of the cost of a solar uh, panel, and then lets people repay over time, over let's say three years, um, uh, to uh, to receive the uh, the entire solar panel to to use free and clear afterwards. But um, while they keep up their payments, uh, they can uh, get the use of the solar panel and. Um, the, uh, the organization, the social enterprise that I was working with uh, is named Simpa Networks. Um, and what they wanted help with was um, on the application form. Um, so uh, they were asking a lot of questions that uh, this is uh, the, uh, the price, uh, sorry, not the price. This is the, um, the information about the, um, the applicant. So they had a long form which the applicant filled out and uh, a lot of uh, different pieces of information. Uh, uh, many of them were free text, which I'll get to in a second, um, and other things. So what sort of assets do you have? Um, what sort of profession are you in? What sort of housing do you live in? And, and so forth. And then they would make the decision, uh, should I or shouldn't I not uh, offer uh, the loan to them uh, for the purpose of the solar panel? Uh, so we wanted to automate that because um, at the time I worked with them, uh, they were just piloting things in about uh, 10 districts in, uh, in India, and uh, they were very poised to expand to, um, to many more districts at the time, and they didn't have loan officers who could handle that load. Okay. Um, and the picture on the right is me um, doing a site visit after we had done, about a year after we had done the work. Um, uh, so I'm actually on the roof of one of the clients who uh, received the, the solar panel. Okay. Um, and where this was, um, that picture was taken in a small village named Barali. It's in uh, the Uttar Pradesh uh, state of uh, North India. So it's not far from New Delhi, the capital, but it is remote enough such that um, uh, the houses there um, were only receiving, let's say, three or four hours of power a day, and um, most of the people were not particularly well off. Um, and interestingly enough, um, although I was doing this project based in New York, um, working through DataKind, which is an organization that um, uh, connects practicing data scientists with, um, with social enterprises, um, uh, this town, Barali, is actually um, in the same part of uh, India where my ancestor, uh, my ancestral home is. So um, Dubai, which is uh, just to the, uh, to the north uh, east of Barali is, uh, where my ancestral home is and a leader um, just south of Barali is where my um, grandparents still live right now. Okay. Um, all right, so in terms of the problem specification phase, uh, the first phase of the machine learning life cycle, um, uh, when you're talking about questions of justice and um, uh, I mean, thinking about this, there is a very important question, a set of questions to be asked, which is, um, is the problem the right one to solve to begin with? And will solving it cause any sort of injustice? So in this particular application, the first sort of impression would be that, um, yeah, why shouldn't we, right? Um, there's people who need power um, who can't afford solar panels. So if we can help them uh, uh, receive that solar power, maybe their kids can study at night, maybe they can do some extra work, um, run a sewing business that they can do at night, and I mean, all sorts of things, right? Um, or charge their phones to, to do other things. So um, at first glance, at face value, I mean, it seems like there shouldn't be any reason not to do it. Um, and more or less, I would say maybe that's true, um, but you can also, it's important to think through what other uh, factors there might be. So. 
really giving grid access to people should be the responsibility of the government and it shouldn't be um, that there even should be a need for this sort of uh, these solar panels so if you do um, enable this even further then maybe the government isn't going to um, uh, increase their uh, their generation supply so maybe that's something or um, maybe there's some other sort of social factors involved where um, uh, people who are in these villages are maybe somewhat at a privilege compared to just around the village. Um, so maybe there's some issues there. So, I mean, there's a lot of potential things that one has to consider, but in this case, um, uh, it, it seemed like a, a good thing to do. So we um, uh, did go ahead with it. And um, then the next question is, what are the objectives? Uh, should I only be optimizing um, uh, for the uh, the task, uh, this loan prediction um, uh, thing, that, um, for from the perspective of the supplier, from Simple Networks' perspective, or are there other factors at play? Is there any sort of fairness consideration that I should have? Um, uh, should uh, I be thinking about any certain groups or individuals that are already at systematic disadvantage and try to um, uh, make sure that they are uh, not uh, given a further systematic disadvantage and so forth. So um, again, you could just have a plain old mean squared error or um, classification accuracy objective, but maybe there's other things to be uh, considering as well. Okay. Um, and it's very important uh, to take advice from a panel of uh, diverse voices in doing this problem specification. So uh, in this case, um, uh, we came in as more of consultants to help um, once the problem was somewhat specified, but um, uh, the, uh, the organization Simple Networks uh, did take uh, a lot of care into um, uh, thinking about the inclusivity of uh, their whole program and, uh, and their operations. Okay. All right, so second stage is data understanding and uh, data preparation. Um, so there's a lot of different biases that can come in. Um, so when you're measuring things, so the features in this case that are being elicited by an applicant filling out a, um, uh, an application form uh, can introduce uh, errors or um, biases if uh, there's some sort of structural bias already in the features that you're collecting. Uh, so if there's, um, for example, one of the features is like uh, if you own any cows or if you own any pigs or things like that, uh, maybe there's some differential um, due to the religion of the individual. Um, so there might be certain uh, things that are already kind of um, differentiating folks uh, that uh, aren't related necessarily to their ability to um, to repay for their loan, but uh, are capturing other things. Okay. And then um, how do you do your sampling is also going to introduce biases. Um, uh, so in this case, uh, there were applicants who, um, whose data we were analyzing, uh, but who was actually given the information that they should apply? Um, how was the, um, the rollout happening of, of SIMPA in these different districts in India? So there's a lot of things that can happen there. And then um, on the data preparation, uh, there can be a lot of interesting uh, uh, biases that come in. So let me mention a few of those in, in our um, particular setting. Okay, so um, we definitely don't want to introduce any new biases when we're doing a, a project like this. Um, so as I had mentioned briefly, the, um, the application form had a lot of free text fields. Um, uh, one of those was the nature of business and people could write in pretty much anything that they wanted in there. And that's not particularly useful for uh, doing a machine learning problem. So um, I actually sat down, um, so since I could kind of interpret the, uh, the language here um, uh, uh, in the team. So I sat down and uh, came up with a list of like 20 different uh, occupations and kind of mapped these um, and so forth. This is just a, a, a subset. Um, and similarly to um, if they're a farmer, um, what commodity that they um, grow. So I did a mapping there. Right? Um, so there was a lot of subjective choice in how I did this. And I'm sure I introduced biases um, in doing so. So how did I come up with the um, categories? How did I map the in individuals to the categories and so forth? Okay. Um, and then one other very interesting thing in this particular application was that uh, 
there was a feature in the data set, which was the applicant's last name. And that's very predictive of the caste and religion of the person um, in this part of India. And um, some of the folks on the Simple Networks team um, were saying, yeah, let's just put that into the model too. Um, if it gives us another couple percent accuracy, why not? Um, and uh, there were others on the Simple Networks team, um, especially their CEO, who was saying that, uh, no, that's not the right thing to do because um, it's going to be, um, I mean, definitely some, I mean, a form of, uh, of injustice to um, uh, potentially discriminate against uh, certain uh, groups and individuals, okay? Um, so that sort of question came up and uh, this was done back in um, uh, 2014, 2015, before um, a lot of uh, work on algorithmic fairness was really picking up steam. So um, we didn't look at it in the bias mitigation sort of perspective, but if we were to do it today, we might um, do that as well. So actually use those um, applicants last name to, uh, to estimate the um, religion and caste and maybe try to have some equality along with it. Okay. And then uh, there's the question of the outcome variable as well. Um, so in our case, we had two options for the outcome variable. One is look at what the human loan officers did in terms of their decisions. Um, uh, who did they approve and who did they deny? Or um, the other option was uh, to look at some of the very early clients uh, who had applied um, and look at whether they um, actually repaid or did not repay um, uh, in over the first two years or three years of their term, but there was a very tiny number of those. Um, so among those two choices, one can potentially introduce human biases because it's a human decision that's being made. In the other case, um, it's there's some actual ground truth associated with whether someone repaid or not, but um, uh, there was very limited data. So um, what we ended up doing actually was something in between. Um, so we did look at actual repayment behavior, um, but whether they were on target in the first six months of that repayment, uh, had they made all their payments up to that point and used that as a, an outcome variable. Um, so I just wanted to point out another example of this where um, you can have outcome variables that are misspecified if they're proxies. Um, so in health insurance in the US, um, there's this process called care management by which um, if you are deemed to be at high risk of illness or are already ill, um, then your health insurance company can assign you um, extra nursing care or extra um, other services that go along with um, trying to be preventative in, in terms of your health. Um, so in the US, um, uh, health insurance uh, is, I mean, uh, it's very common and uh, uh, it's done in such a way that uh, there's claims that are submitted by um, providers, so doctors and pharmacies and so forth to the health insurance company of what they need to reimburse. And this is the sort of data that um, can be used, but um, uh, to analyze uh, uh, the, the membership of a, of a health plan. Uh, but it doesn't actually quantify how sick someone is. Um, and a lot of health insurance companies use the cost or the health utilization of the patient as a proxy for how sick they are. Um, but it turns out um, if you use that as an outcome variable, so if you cost more that you should get more care management, uh, that uh, it misses out on uh, African-Americans specifically um, and other uh, marginalized groups because um, uh, they utilize the healthcare system less than others like uh, like whites, for example. So, um, so using the wrong proxy variable can actually um, lead you astray as well in terms of fairness issues. Okay. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to mention was the modeling step. Um, so you've done the problem specification and the data understanding and data um, pre uh, preparation. So you're at the modeling step. Um, there are various bias mitigation algorithms out there um, that one can use. Um, they apply different points in the process. You can have pre-processing, in-processing, and post-processing algorithms. And uh, our group has actually made an open source uh, toolkit available, um, which implements many of these algorithms. And it's called uh, AI Fairness 360. Um, so you can uh, definitely check that out. And it has both uh, R version and a Python version. 
Uh, so let me pause there um, just to summarize. Um, uh, there's all these different parts of the machine learning lifecycle. There's all sorts of things that can come up. Um, and it really is important to, um, to do this in, in a very careful manner while you're um, developing uh, machine learning systems because there can be lots of issues of fairness and uh, injustice that come up, which are subtle and uh, really require some thought. Uh, so let me stop there and um, pass it off uh, to the uh, 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 to the rest of the uh, the panel. Yes, thank you so much. Um, next, we're going to go to Christian Liu. Um, I think you should be able to share your screen. Oh, there's my voice. Um, one second. Hold on. Do your screen share. Many buttons to press. Give me one second. Okay. Um, and can you let me know if this is showing up for you all? Yeah, we can see it. And, okay, one second. I think I want to switch my screens here. So I'm looking at you all. There. All right. I think now we see a presenter view. So I think ah, no. Okay. So I <laughs> won't do that. Darn it. Okay. Let's put it back so I can find my mouse. Let me do it again. Sorry about that. Still presenter. Yeah, oh, there we go. There you so go. That, Perfect. Yeah. I like how um, when we were planning, I was like, yeah, I do this all the time. It'll be fine. So that was <laughs> a um, 30 second detour there. And Claire, um, if if I do sort of go over, please do feel free to interrupt me because Sounds um, good. I haven't. Yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly how the timing of this is going to work out. Will do. All right. I think I actually jumped ahead one slide in all of that um, madness there. All right. Hi. Yeah. So I'm Christiane Lum. And um, I wanted to talk to you all a little bit today about a few different examples or maybe counter examples from criminal justice when we're talking about the use of predictive models. Um, the topics of fairness, accountability, and transparency have been really big in the past several years um, in machine learning and in socio-technical systems more broadly. Um, but in 15 minutes, I'm going to try to um, address the fairness and the accountability and leave off the transparency, though, of course, if um, that's something folks want to talk about later, that's something we can also talk about in this context. All right, so the first example I want to talk about is the F, the fairness, um, and the example I want to talk about for that is predictive policing. So the question here you might ask in this case is what is predictive policing? I kind of just threw that term out without defining it. So let me take a moment to define it now. Um, predictive policing uses police records to learn patterns in the occurrence of crime. Um, so that, that's sort of how it's, how it's marketed. I think I, I've crossed out a lot of these things um, and sort of put my own maybe a little bit snarky spin on them to, to emphasize some of the disconnect between the crime, crime itself and the measurement of crime. So I think I would sort of rewrite that to say, to learn patterns in the police records themselves. So then using these patterns, the computer will predict the most likely locations of future crimes. Um, and again, sort of going back to that distinction I was drawing, really the most likely locations where crime will be detected in the future. If the model is trained on the police records, what it is predicting for the future are police records. And if there is a disconnect between crime and where police are recording crime, there will be a similar disconnect in those predictions. So then additional police are dispatched to the locations with the highest predicted rate of crime. Um, the idea here is being that this would prevent crime that would have occurred or catch criminals in the act while they're there. Um, one question one could ask is what happens if they also find crime um, that they wouldn't have found other otherwise um, when they are deployed. One thing I should add to this little summary is that predictive policing takes many forms. Um, I, I'm talking about the location-based form here, and that's what I'm going to be discussing in a second, but there are also systems that are used to predict which individuals will be most likely to um, commit crimes in the future or in some cases be victims of crimes themselves. Um, but again, I'm talking about the location-based here. All right, and so one additional piece of information, and this sort of ties back into what Kush was talking about just a second ago, is the predictive policing system that I'm going to be talking about today um, uses only a few different variables. So the time and location and type of the previous crime, of, of the history of crimes of the police records. It doesn't include anything, for example, like race of the individual who um, committed the crime. It doesn't include anything like the demographics of the location where the um, where the crime occurred. And for this reason, this sort of software is often described as, quote, 
race neutral. And so that's just something to keep in mind as we go forward, because I think a lot of the um, impetus for moving towards more automated systems um, and more machine learning based systems is this idea that this will necessarily bring about more fairness. Um, the idea being you can omit things that you would like to omit and then the, the predictions will somehow um, be fair with respect to those things. All right, and so the example I want to give has to has to do with drug crimes in Oakland. So I'm using this data set um, that I got from OpenOakland.org. They had drug crimes that were um, recorded by police in Oakland in 2010. Um, don't let it throw you on the top that the uh, the, the label says drug crime reports. This is the re a report in the sense of a noun, not a, sorry of a. Um, yeah, a noun, not a verb. So this is it. There is a report in the system, like a record, um, not necessarily only things that people report to police. In any case, what you can see was, is when we look at this data, we see essentially one hot spot that will be shown in red in the upper left hand corner there. Um, and there's also an area sort of down along the lower right where we see that there's some pink. So there are some records down there with most of the records occurring um, in, in the place that's the brightest red. I'm sort of working under the assumption that most people know how to, to, to read a heat map here. Um, it should be pretty self-explanatory. All right. The other thing we did was we used public health data um, and detailed demographic information about Oakland to estimate where drug users actually are. So if you look at this comparison here, on the left, you see there's really only a few places where we're seeing um, a lot of records in, in the police system. Um, but on the right, if we were to use a sort of different lens or different data set perspective on where drug use is taking place. We'd see that it's much more diffuse than what we're seeing in the um, in the police data. And I would interpret this to mean that the locations, um, sort of brighter locations on the left that are disproportionately bright relative to the right um, is where the over enforcement and policing of drug related um, laws is occurring. And by the way, the figure on the right, um, though there are some differences in shade that is mostly in this case driven by population density more than anything. Um, because if you sort of dig down into the public health surveys, there doesn't tend to be a whole lot of um, differences in rates of drug use um, by things like um, say race, for example, which I'm going to come to in a second. I think another important way to look at um, this map is through the sort of the demographic composition of Oakland. So I've tried to match up that circle and that line in the two figures. So on within the circle, we see that it's mostly green dots in this map. Um, the green dots each refer to a, each represent one black person in Oakland. Um, and the line sort of lines up right along this orangish corridor which, and a little green too, which corresponds to, orange corresponds to Hispanic people. Um, just for completeness here, red corresponds to Asian and blue corresponds to white. So we can see that um, if, you, if you were willing to buy into my interpretation of that is where over-policing and over-enforcement of drug laws was taking place, that it's largely taking place in the black and Hispanic um, communities in the past in 2010. And so the idea was, I wanted to take this predictive policing algorithm, run it on this historical data and make predictions to see where it would continue to send police officers or where police officers would be sent in the future if this, if this algorithm were implemented. Um, and let me click this figure right here. All right. And so each of the bright red boxes you see in the video on the left shows one of the top 20 predicted squares by day. So I used the data in 2010. Um, to make a prediction for each day in 2011. So this works by using a sliding window approach. Um, so use the last year's worth of data to make a prediction for one day forward after that. And obviously this, this requires using data into 2011 as well. All right. And what we can see from this, each of the black dots, by the way, are where drug crimes were detected in the, um, in the historical data on each date as this runs through. All right. And so what we see is that um, the red squares really concentrate in those same areas that I had flagged as likely over-policed in the past, um, but in that largely African-American neighborhood up in the upper left and along that largely Hispanic corridor down on the right. We can again sort of compare this to public health data, sort of renormalized by um, by the demographics of Oakland. And I won't get into the details of exactly how I did that. And we can look at if this were actually implemented, who would be receiving this targeted policing? And you know, visually, you can see this in the map on the left. Perhaps it's no surprise that that we see on the right that the percent of people receiving targeted policing would be twice the rate in the black population 
as it would in the white population. This is sort of um, perpetuating that same sort of bias that we saw that we saw in the sort of historical policing practices as encoded by the police records. And again, just to sort of continue to make this point when we looked at the um, public health data, it really didn't seem like there were large discrepancies in the rate of drug use um, disaggregated by race. All right, and so what this has to do with fairness is essentially the idea that just because this model, like I mentioned, doesn't use anything like race of the person who, who appears in the record, doesn't use anything explicitly about the demographics of the location where the record occurred, even so we're essentially in, omitting all race data, right? And even so, we can end up perpetuating some of the same um, racial bias that appears in the data. And so I think this calls for very careful consideration of how um, of a, a bias mitigation of how data is used. Um, it's not simply enough, as Kush mentioned, by the way, um, to to omit to omit a variable and trust that that results in um, an algorithm that is in some way fair with respect to the variable that's omitted. Um, it takes a lot more care than that. All right. The second example from criminal justice that I want to go into, and this one I'll be fairly brief on, is accountability. And I want to do that um, with an example from pretrial risk assessment. And in particular, I want to talk a little bit about how overbooking can impact the ultimate um, recommendation of the system. So very quickly, again, let me just tell you what pretrial risk assessment is. I'm not going to go into the details of this. It takes many different forms, many different model types. Um, but the cartoon version is you have some sort of input data about an individual. When an individual is arrested, um, they'll usually go through some sort of interview or data on them will be pulled. Um, that's represented by the input data here that will be plugged into a risk assessment model. Again, I'm leaving this as a blackish gray box for the moment. I won't go into too much more detail about that. And out the other end of that will come either a risk score, so something like one to 10, one to six, or a recommendation. Um, this person should be released before their trial. Um, there should be some condition or some recommendations of conditions for this person. Um, and in some extreme cases, a release not recommended. So this will be used to inform decision makers about how this person should be treated before the, their case is concluded. Um, so in one particular risk assessment model that I'm looking at today, um, some of the inputs, and these are fairly common inputs to pretrial risk assessment models, are the individual's criminal history, some demographic information, usually things like age, um, and the booking charges. And the idea here is these booking charges are um, highly discretionary. So when the arresting officer takes the person to the, to, to the, to the jail to be booked, um, they report specific charges that are that are justifying that person's arrest and as i understand it from talking to practitioners there is very little oversight or feedback or accountability about how representative those charges actually are um, of of the of the behavior that they they've witnessed or seen or, or or been told about all right and so the idea here is we want to understand how that sort of that that discretion in booking charges can impact the ultimate pretrial recommendations Okay, and here are some examples from the case I'm looking at. This is an example I did using data from um, San Francisco. These are some example decisions that could be made. Um, this is, you know, I, I've cut out a lot of the middle part of this, so because I don't can't go into details about what the model actually looks like. But this model can recommend four different levels of um, supervision pre-trial. So green is basically just let the person go. Red is release not recommended. Yellow and orange, as you can imagine, are somewhere in the middle. And the ordering is green, yellow, orange, red, an increasing level of um, supervision. All right, so the plan, what we wanted to do was we got some data from San Francisco. It was about 2,000 records of the use of a pretrial risk assessment tool during a pilot period. Um, I did this in collaboration with the public defender's office there. Um, and so we reproduced the re risk assessment model. It's essentially, um, without going into detail, again, a, a combination of statistical models and some complicated decision tree placed on top of it that take inputs about the booking charges. And so we ran the risk assessment models using the original booking charges to get one of those recommendations. So out the other end, we get a recommendation that green, yellow, orange, or red based on the booking charges. And then we sit around and we wait two years. And we say, OK, what would the risk assessment model have said if we only could have used, if we'd only used the charges the person was actually convicted of? 
And then we're going to compare those two recommendations. So the idea here is that if the booking charge recommendation is higher than the conviction charge recommendation, then that recommendation was actually only driven by charges that were ultimately unsubstantiated um, by the criminal legal process. And in some ways that could be, that could be viewed as unfair. You know, sort of on the other hand, the, the eventual conviction charges aren't available at the time of running of the model. But in any case, I think this sort of analysis is, is important to see how, how much sort of wiggle room there is between those. And if I could go into detail about the model, I guess what I would say is that um, when you look, when you sort of eyeball how the conviction charges are entering into this, it seems like it shouldn't be the case that the model, there's a large discrepancy between these two things. Um, because it seems like it's only really serious booking charges that 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 should be able to raise your scores. It's, it's things like being booked under things like murder, for example, um, that that really pop out as things that that would um, change your score. And those things seem like things that wouldn't happen to a large proportion of the population and then be dropped later. All right. And so, um, you know, again, I'm I'm sort of doing a, a brief version here, but the bottom line result that I think was the eye-catching result to me what is what circled in red here and that was that for 27 about 28 20 yeah 27 percent of the people or the cases that were evaluated by this tool during the um during this pilot period those people had a higher recommendation for under the booking charges than they did under the conviction charges to say that again their um they had a higher recommendation due only to charges that were ultimately unsubstantiated by the courts um, and so I think this this points to increased need for accountability around those um, booking charges. I think plugging them through a model like this in some way legitimizes them. I think if they were, you know, displayed to a judge or decision maker directly, um, there's, you know, some sort of processing that goes into how how well supported those charges are, especially for the things that are very, very serious. Um, whereas when those charges get sort of pushed through this model, that's not super easily understandable just with a quick glance um, and out the other end comes something like do not release or release not recommended. I think this adds additional weight to those charges that are, you know, ultimately not substantiated in, in many cases. Um, and also I think points to the possibility of gaming in this sort of system. So for example, if um, there's an individual who is, you know, for whatever reason an officer thinks need to stay off the street for longer. It seems as though since it happens in a non negligible portion of cases adding on some additional charges that could then result in a release not recommended um, Recommendation could very easily fly under the radar. Um, and I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm good on time. So I think I'll just end right there. Since we have a robust discussion planned. I won't do too much in the way of uh, summarizing or concluding. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much. Very interesting talk. I I think our, our final speaker is Alex Childachova. Um, Christian, if you... I'm trying yeah. to stop for some reason. <laughs> okay. Perfect, perfect, great. It can follow uh, my mouse. <laughs> Alex, I think you should be good to go. Perfect. Let me see if I can get this uh, up and running. Hopefully everyone sees a full screen slide right now. Yep, we can. Okay, fantastic. Um, so thanks everyone for being here and of course to the organizers for putting together an event on this really important topic. Um, just a few years ago when I first got involved in this area of research and when this, this sort of set of topics was becoming an area of research, I was in conversation with another statistician who was wondering what exactly all the technical problems are, um, like what the inherently statistical problems are and hopefully some of the uh, comments made by the previous two speakers have helped to highlight that. Um, in this talk, uh, in a departure from my disciplinary training as a statistician and most of my quantitative work, I'll actually be speaking about a qualitative study we conducted, which was intended to investigate affected community perspectives on algorithmic decision making and child welfare services. So I do a lot of work in criminal justice, but this is uh, this area of child welfare is another one of these uh, social issues that while it's not as uh, kind of prevalently covered in the news, it is a really massive problem. And this is all part of um, a broader agenda to examine factors that influence trust and perceptions of legitimacy in algorithmic systems, be they in child welfare or other situations. So since this is a study focused on child welfare, let me start by giving you just a tiny bit of background on the US child welfare system. 
the first thing that I was surprised to learn and that you might be surprised to learn as well is that over one in three children in the US are estimated to experience a Child Protective Services investigation by the age of 18. And I cite this statistic just to give you a sense of the scale of the problem. And in 2018 alone, child welfare agencies around the country received 4.3 million referrals, which is to say allegations of child maltreatment and neglect that involved nearly 8 million children. And three and a half million of those children received an investigation or an alternate response through the system following that referral. This process of determining whether to follow up a referral is called call screening. And it's a really challenging task. So referral calls <clears throat> can be really vague and inconclusive, which is a lot of where the challenge comes in. This leaves call workers with insufficient information to determine which referrals should actually be investigated by caseworkers, which ones should be followed up on. And while rich administrative data is readily available thanks to the big data revolution, um, this information is hardly ever used consistently, and there's really no assurance that the data could be used effectively or systematically given sheer, uh, the sheer number of uh, tables and fields um, that number in the hundreds if not thousands that are contained in these administrative data sets. So this is really where algorithmic tools can help. Over the past few years, I've been working on developing a um, sorry, I've been working on a series of projects aimed at developing, deploying, and also assessing the impact of algorithmic tools in child welfare. And while we've been seeing some positive results, particularly with the tool that's been deployed in the call screening uh, context that I just described, the use of such tools has no doubt attracted considerable criticism and concern. So I'm not sure if um, many of you have read or heard of Virginia Eubanks's book called Automated Inequality, uh, but she extracted a chapter of that into this Wired article that I show on the left. And she's argued that by virtue of relying on administrative data that is more comprehensive on poorer families and wealthier ones, so more comprehensive on people who rely more greatly on county provided services and thus whose reliance is tracked in the data, the call screening tool that we've deployed mistakes parenting while poor for poor parenting. And on the right, I highlight a piece from Richard Rexler, who's an outspoken critic of data-driven methods in child welfare more generally. And he's written a number of critical pieces about both the call screening tool and a new at birth model that the county has been developing, which is aimed at identifying families with newborn children who might benefit the most from the offering of voluntary supportive services. So in other words, there's lots of criticism out there. At the end of the day, um, given the nature of the work that I do, I am of course, one of many people who believe that algorithmic decision support systems can help workers in the child welfare system to protect children and support families, just as they could be useful in other contexts as well. But to succeed in the same, we need systems that are reliable, trustworthy, and trusted. And the first point is that not all systems that are out there can be considered reliable. Um, indeed, we've argued in other work, a lot of the more quantitative work that myself and others in my research lab have been involved with, we've argued that the most widely used approaches to developing risk assessment tools for these sorts of applications fail to provide reliable risk information. So Christian's talk, for instance, talked about <clears throat> a couple of criminal justice applications in which the way that we develop tools may lead to more or less reliable um, risk information as far as decision making is concerned. But even if we do everything that we can to produce reliable tools, so we produce better predictive policing systems, for instance, um, there are going to be significant challenges in getting the public and users of the trust to, of users of the system to trust them. And I by no means wish to imply that it's a foregone conclusion that if you build something that's reliable, that it should necessarily be trusted. Um, <clears throat> but rather that uh, this is a separate obstacle, and this is something that was highlighted in Kush's talk for sure. And I want to argue also that these issues go much deeper than compliance with laws and regulation. So as Haytan Shah puts it, there's enormous opportunity for positive social impact from the rise of algorithms and machine learning, but this requires a license to operate from the public based on trustworthiness. And this license to operate idea comes from business practices. We can think of this as perceived legitimacy. And he goes on to say, We've seen before in the case of genetic modification what can happen when science is pushing forward but loses public trust. This can set the take up of the science back significantly. 
So again, to reiterate, I don't think that all the science that's being developed should necessarily be taken up, but it's also worth recognizing that even the technologies where at some level we would agree that the pros outweigh the cons, um, if we advance too far ahead of where the public is, um, we're not actually going to realize any of that potential. So in our case, the question is, what can we learn about the factors that contribute to public trust in algorithmic decision making? We examine this question in a qualitative study of affected community perspectives on the use of algorithmic tools in the child welfare system. And our study reflects just one element of a broader participatory design effort to improve child welfare outcomes through the use of data-driven algorithmic tools. Our work examines three questions, and in this presentation I'll focus on the first two, which are, firstly, how do people who are most likely to be subject to or affected by algorithmic decision making feel about the deployment of such systems? And second, what are the primary sources of community discomfort surrounding the development and deployment of such tools? We framed our investigation within the structure of organizational uh, organizational justice perceptions, which originate in research investigating employees' attitudes and behaviors towards their employers. So in a 2001 study, Colquitt identified four central components of justice perceptions, which are procedural, distributive, informational, and interpersonal. And the three that we find most relevant to interpreting the results of our qualitative analysis are procedural, informational, and interpersonal justice. Now, procedural justice reflects the perceived fairness of the processes that produce the decisions and outcomes. And this is something that's been pointed out in many places, particularly in the criminal justice context, as being extremely important. Informational justice, which reflects the sufficiency and completeness of information provided to explain and justify decisions and outcomes, relates to these themes of transparency that have already been raised in previous talks. One thing that hasn't been raised so much is this idea of interpersonal justice, and this is actually found to play a really big role in our findings. Interpersonal justice reflects the extent to which people are treated with dignity and respect by those making communicating decisions. And I'll return to this theme um, throughout the remainder of the presentation. Our workshop study uh, was conducted in Allegheny County, County, Pennsylvania, which is home to Pittsburgh. And uh, over the period of two weeks, we ran five two-hour community workshops that engaged 83 participants from three different groups. These groups included families within the child welfare system, frontline providers, who these are people who are in regular contact with families and are staff employed at child welfare agencies or service providers, and then specialists who work at child welfare agencies but do not have direct contact with families. And so when I, at the outset of the talk, I said that we were investigating affected community perspectives, we view the users, the intended users of these systems, um, and those to whom risk information might be communicated from these systems, so people like frontline providers and specialists, as affected. Um, in particular, their job practices, their day-to-day, -day, their interactions with families um, are, um, are affected. Families are, of course, affected in a different way as the subjects of these tools. To facilitate meaningful participant conversations about subject matter that's both technically complex and naturally emotionally challenging, we crafted a fictional scenario which we called Nicole's story. And in this scenario, participants were invited to imagine that they're a parent of a young girl named Nicole and were facilitated through a series of fictional events that unfold as Nicole grows up. So even though they were adopting this viewpoint of you are the parent, just to give them some sort of persona from which to comment on the case, um, throughout the discussions, the participants certainly relied a lot on their experience and whatever role they came from and their experience within the child welfare system um, in forming their responses. So each of the different scenarios, of which there are six, was designed to explore variations of interest to the research team. Um, and these variations of interest fell along three dimensions. So there were different decision-making frameworks, which ranged from whether the decision was made entirely by a human, a human assisted by an algorithm, or a fully automated decision-making system. The second dimension was whether the decision was being made in a proactive or reactive way. So a proactive example would be a call comes into the child abuse hotline and, sorry, a, a reactive decision is when a call, for instance, comes into the child abuse hotline and the call worker needs to decide how to react. So should they screen this call in for investigation or not? 
A proactive example is more like the at-birth model where the family has not asked for support, no one has called them in, but the county is still interested in seeing if they can more proactively offer services in a voluntary manner on the basis of assessed future poor outcomes. And the third dimension of variation is the sort of data that is used. So whether it's narrowly tailored to the child welfare domain or more broad, extending to things like criminal justice, other social services, or even neighborhood characteristics that aren't specific to the family. What we found is that first and foremost, system level concerns were the most common reasons given for low comfort in algorithm assisted in algorithmic decision making. In other words, discomfort with prior experiences with the child welfare system were readily projected onto the algorithmic decision making scenarios, resulting in low comfort there as well. The algorithm didn't make things worse in many cases, but it also didn't make things better. It's hard to disentangle the role of the algorithm or trust in the algorithm in a system that's otherwise viewed as untrustworthy. And families most strongly voiced the concern that their prior interactions with the system felt largely adversarial. For instance, they would say things like, it's been me versus the system. They would look at me more because I had previous experience than because they wanted to help me with my daughter. So again, it didn't really matter now that there was some sort of algorithm involved. The overall perspectives were colored by these past experiences. Secondly, and quite expectedly, all groups raised concerns about potential bias on the part of caseworkers involved in the decision process, as well as bias present in the data or algorithm. So as we think about these questions of social justice and the use of algorithms, we can't just focus on the second part. So is the algorithm biased or unbiased in some sort of vacuum sense? Uh, we really need to think about how that algorithm is being used, the manner in which that information will be taken up, um, and whether that will lead to potential disparities. So thirdly, participants question whether a statistical model could adequately account for all relevant decision elements and emphasize the need for a human in the loop approach. So one of the specialists was quoted as saying, use data without removing human decision making. And one of the family participants said, a computer can't understand context. My son has autism, how does the data account for this? And I think there's a really different uh, burden on transparency and explanations in context that depends on the nature of the decision that's being made. So if you're trying to use these systems to inform some sort of supportive service decisions of what should we offer to this family, not knowing that a child uh, has autism is going to be a huge pitfall in the effectiveness of any strategies you might have. You might just make the wrong recommendations. So we need to think really carefully about when we feel like the data and the specific risks that we're assessing or the way that the algorithm has been defined sufficiently captures all the relevant context. The fourth, participants wanted more information on how the algorithm weighs different factors and the ability to dispute the score. So this is a more kind of disclosure type of transparency. They wanted to see documentation. They wanted to know what actually went into the tool, but they also wanted to be able to contest the score, right? And these concerns about recourse and communication were raised not only in the context of specific decisions, but more broadly in the context of choosing to adopt an algorithmic tool in the first place. So as one frontliner provide as one frontline provider put it, it's upon the agency to justify how a computer tool is better than no computer tool. And we found that participants specifically wanted to know how these algorithmic tools could help increase child safety, decrease bias, and also importantly, increase strength-based family support. Lastly, we found that even potentially beneficial decisions resulted in discomfort due to concerns about how and whether risk information was communicated to families and caseworkers. And let me tell you a little bit more about the scenario where this issue was most clearly observed. Alex, so just, this, you have about one minute left. Just okay. Good. This is uh, the last slide I wanted to cover. Um, so in this fourth scenario, uh, that was shown to participants, so scenario D, we describe a situation where Nicole becomes pregnant at age 16 and gives birth to a baby boy. And then while at the hospital, Nicole received a visit from a nurse explaining that she's been identified by a statistical tool as needing support. And the nurse offers her free home visits and access to other services to help her and her baby during his first year. So first of all, participants were very much in approval of the fact that and that young mothers would be offered supportive services such as home visits, and they view those as potentially being extremely helpful. However, in part two of the scenario, the nurse 
we, we describe that the nurse further explains that one in five mothers identified by this tool wind up having their child placed in foster care absent supportive services like home visits. And this information was intended by the research team to communicate the positive predictive value of the tool. <clears throat> so how accurate is this system? And in part three, that PPV becomes four and five. So to say that this tool is even more accurate at really identifying um, mothers and children, newly born children, who are at very high risk of adverse outcomes. And the discussion that accompanied the scenario really helped drive home the importance of considering how the information provided by algorithmic tools is communicated and how important that communication strategy is to the ultimate outcomes and interpersonal justice perceptions. In particular, saying that the mother, uh, saying that mothers like her have a one in five chance of having their child removed uh, was perceived as a threat and saying that there's a four in five chance was perceived as a bigger threat. So this is pretty much a non-starter. And in general, participants were wholly opposed to any mention of a statistical tool in this context. Um, so this is all to say that there's something to be said for transparency and sometimes as statisticians or technologists, we want to convey as much information as possible, but we really need to think more carefully about how that information is conveyed and to whom and the impact that this might have on downstream outcomes. So that's all I had for today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we're going to move to some questions and answers now. I've, I've already received a couple of questions, so I'm, I'm just going to start us off with one that's already been sent. Um, and this is mostly for Christian, but I think others could probably tune in here as well. Um, so I think you've shown that it's, it's pretty clearly that it's not enough to just omit a variable from an analysis. You can still uh, perpetuate racial bias, for example. I'm wondering if um, any of the panelists could give some ideas or how other methods to mitigate bias rather than just omission of a variable. Christian, perhaps we'll start with you if you want. Yeah, so um, one thing I just wanted to start by saying before this is that um, Alex is actually one of the sort of like foremost experts also in these criminal justice applications. So um, not to put you on the spot, Alex, but I think any and all um, criminal justice related questions could equally be directed to her because um, we sort of divided up the, the content here just in neat little bins, um, but I just wanted to flag that. All right, so how can you mitigate bias? Um, returning to the question, how can you mitigate bias if it's not omitting the variable? Um, you know, there, there are sort of a lot of different ways that people think about how they could do that. I think one way would be to consider using different data. I think that's probably um, one of the best ways. I think, you know, there are some ways that are more technical, some ways that are less technical. I think, you know, also redefining how you, redefining your outcome variable, for example, is another way you might get around that with the idea that if you could find some sort of contextually relevant outcome variable that um, is less prone to the sort of social or historical or sampling or measurement bias, any of the sorts of biases that we could think about, um, that, that might be, um, that would maybe make you less likely to end up in a situation where you're perpetuating some sort of um, harm, harmful past behavior. Um, what else is there? There's also, I mean, taking a step back even, even farther, sort of zooming out even much larger, I think, you know, there's always the, the possibility of not building some sort of, um, not building some sort of machine learning statistical AI based tool. I think that's actually where the conversation should really start when you're worried about um, bias is sort of really identifying the problem that you're trying to solve and um, identifying whether prediction is going to help you solve that, that bigger problem. And I think sometimes it might be one component, but it's not the only component. So sort of uh, zooming out beyond that, you know, there, there are sort of technical approaches as well. You could um, explicitly incorporate information about the sensitive variables that you're concerned about. In the example I gave, there's race. Often in the employment examples, it's also gender um, and do some sort of correction um, in the data so that there are fewer, just less disparities, um, less, less, you know, more, more equality, I guess, but um, short of, short of going into like, fairly technical details, I think, just suffice it to say that there are that there are some approaches to that. But I think the first place I would start would be sort of to scrutinize sort of the process behind collecting the data and, and evaluate whether there's some other source or some other measure that might get you closer to, to what you'd like. 
Yeah, Alex or Kush, do you have anything to add to that? Um, the only thing I would add is, um, I mean, Christian, I mean, said it very well. Um, so just a little bit more detail on those technical approaches. Um, just at a very basic level, what you're aiming for is um, some sort of statistical independence between the protected attributes and the predicted labels. And there's various ways of achieving that. So um, the uh, pre-processing of the data, training data set, adding extra constraints or um, uh, other sort of regularization terms into the learning algorithm or doing some post-processing where you um, uh, make some changes to the output predictions and all of those can achieve um, these sort of goals. Yeah, I think more generally, if you can be uh, precise about what you mean by bias and what would what it would look like to have an unbiased model, then of course you can, and you can characterize that quantitatively, then of course you can pose that as constraints on whatever um, a system that you're optimizing. I think the challenge in many cases is that we don't have a good sense of what an unbiased world would look like. Um, and certainly we don't have a precise qu quantification of what that would look like. And absent that, um, it's hard to make something that feels like a clear progress in the direction of algorithmic fairness, or at least meaningful algorithmic fairness. And I think if I could just add one thing to what Alex just said, um, even if you personally can come up with what you think, you know, a, an appropriate mathematical definition of fairness is in a particular context, I think it's important to realize that just like when we're talking about um, fairness sort of less quantitatively, there will be other people who disagree with that definition. Um, and in many cases, sort of the takeaway I've had from a lot of the debate about different metrics of fairness that you might want to optimize for is that when you're living in a world that is unfair in some way, so there's sort of different rates of success or failure or different rates of some outcome between different groups you're concerned about, um, different people will have different ideas about which notions they think are appropriate. And there are, there are reasonable arguments in favor of pretty much any of those definitions and you can't have them all. So somebody's going to be unhappy um, and they're going to be able to point to something very reasonably and be like, this is why I'm unhappy. You didn't meet this metric. And yes, the world, you know, it, we're sort of living in a world where, where, where you're not going to be able to. Yeah, thank you. I have a couple more questions that folks sent to me, but um, yeah, I just saw somebody type one in the chat or if you want to raise your hand, I can also keep uh, track of questions that way. Um, Christian, I got one other specific uh, question for you. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on that 27.4% and who's affected by the higher booking, have you looked into who's affected by the higher booking charges disproportionately? I have, yes, and that is something that requires a little bit of a detour to talk about. Um, so we did look at it, we disaggregated it by race. That is one of the um, most relevant variables, I think, when we're concerned about bias in criminal justice data and in the criminal justice system. And sort of in a nutshell, what we found was that um, black people, we divided it up into black and non-black. And the reason for this, even though, you know, race is obviously much more complicated than black and non-black and even sort of binning, you know, erases a lot of the sort of complexity there, we found that um, when we were looking at the data, um, there was not a whole lot of consistency between racial classifications, except for black and non-black. Um, every other category that was given was fairly inconsistent. Um, and I think this is because it wasn't a self-identification, it was identification by um, the person who was recording the data, so not the person who um, was arrested. And so that was why we ended up dividing it up into black and not black, just because which of the occasions do you use, you, you know, it got, it got sort of complicated. And what we found was that sort of cartoon version is that yes, black people were more likely to have um, charges, to have overbooked charges that resulted in various components of the risk assessment algorithm um, be elevated. So what I didn't get to go into is there's sort of several sub steps in in the process for creating that final score. There's one where if you're if you're booking charges on this list, things like um, murder, rape, things like that, you're automatically not um, you're automatically binned into that do not release category. If it's on some other list, then you are bumped up by one. So instead of a green, you go to a yellow. Instead of a yellow, you go to orange, etc. We found that across most of those steps, I believe all of them, black people were more likely to have one of those intermediate steps like bumped up, have like a higher metric for each of the things that go into the final score based on charges that were ultimately unsubstantiated. 
However, when we looked at the discrepancies in the final recommendation, there weren't, there weren't differences between black and non-black people. Um, and the reason for this is that if you, how this whole system works, you start with this sort of like initial recommendation that's based on your criminal history, et cetera. So you start maybe with a green and then your booking charges come in and they say, okay, but that should actually be bumped all the way up to red, or maybe that should just be bumped up to yellow, right? Um, and so that initial recommendation started off on average higher for black people than non-black people. And so once you start factoring in all of these sort of exclusions and bump ups or all these sort of charge based rules that go on to increasing that recommended level because black people were more likely to start in the highest bin or the second highest bin than non-black people. Ultimately, the difference didn't end up making, it, there wasn't a large difference, right? So if you say had a merger, bur, murder booking charge that was dropped, right? But you were already in that highest bin, um, there was no difference between what happened under your booking and, not, and, and conviction charges because the charge made no difference. You couldn't go up any higher anyway. And so, you know, I think that's sort of, hard to convey without slides, so I, <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, so it's, it was sort of like a mixed result in the sense that there was evidence that overbooking was impacting um, black defendants more than non-black defendants, but when we looked at that final um, recommendation, it seems like it, it wasn't really showing up there because there were so many other places along the way that things had accumulated that it was sort of pushing up against a wall where you couldn't really see that difference. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. So I'm gonna ask Camille's question that she put in the chat and maybe Alex, you could take a first go at this. So I'm, I'm wondering if you've thought about the role of restorative justice in this process and specifically uh, Camille says, um, one of the arguments of restorative justice, for example, is that those who commit murder are some of the least likely to, to be repeat offenders. So um, she's asking how could restorative justice fit into predictive algorithms for sen sentencing? I think this is a good question. And um, <clears throat> just a point about Camille's question is that this pertains to uh, to sentencing, right, which is rather different than pretrial. It's also rather different than um, law enforcement. And the work that I did on um, risk assessment in the sentencing context and the, some of the lit review that I did as part of that, uh, one of the things that was pretty consistent is that risk assessment was mostly of interest in um, low severity cases. So. Uh, once you're up to murder charges, risk plays virtually no role um, in terms of the sentencing outcomes for an individual. This uh, basically factors such as um, retributional considerations um, far outweigh risk. Where risk tends to <clears throat> come into play in informing sentencing guidelines is for individuals, for instance, whose charges put them at the border of a misdemeanor or a felony, they may be eligible for a prison sentence, but they may still be eligible for release and making decisions for those sorts of individuals. Um, the other thing is that the sort of risk assessment that you might want um, for a sort of restorative justice use particularly for things as severe and rare as murder cases, I think would have to be much more individualized than the sorts of, um, sometimes they're called risk screening tools that we might be talking about that take eight factors into account and aren't specific to murder cases. Um, so I think there's a poor fit, both in terms of the sort of considerations uh, that are relevant to these high severity charges, um, and also the types of risk assessment instruments that are most commonly used throughout the criminal justice system um, that are based on more administrative data rather than um, in-person interviews. So I think one would have to really proceed carefully and ask about like, what is the role of risk if the convicted offense is actually of a murder variety? Coach or Christian, do you have some, anything to add there? Um, I just wanted to add one thing, which is not specifically on restorative justice, but um, uh, there's a new paper out from Harvard. Um, it's called Look Ahead Regularization from Predictions to Decisions. And um, it's actually a really nice paper, which kind of asks the question, if you are going to be taking actions and looking at what a person is going to be doing in the future, how should you change the predictive model to account for that? And I think that could be relevant for, um, for this sort of uh, application as well. Great. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind um, putting the name of that paper in the chat, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. Uh, Sam, we'll go to you. I see if your hand raised. If you would like to unmute, you're welcome to. Oh, okay. 
sorry, I uh, put it in the chat for you. I'll just read out loud. Perfect. Um, so in Christian's talk, uh, you talked a little bit about gaming the system and in Alex's, uh, the emphasis was really about transparency and trust. So are there any insights or um, thoughts going on as far as having more of a white box approach to algorithms or being transparent while accounting for the potential for being exposed to that gaming. Alex, do you want to go or? So, sorry, I was actually reading the chat trying to find the question and kind of got lost in the beginning of it. So, so can you summarize that? I apologize for that. I was like scanning through the chat looking for it. Oh, sorry. I said it there. directly to Claire. <laughs> oh, okay. That's why. Sorry. I'm I not just put it, it in the chat. I'm not at reading and listening. So, sorry about that. <laughs> it's I put it, now. Yeah, I put it in the chat. Maybe, Alex, you could take a first go at it. Okay. Um, sorry. Sure. Um, so, this is a problem that we've been thinking about a little bit and where you can see like meaningful transparency and gameability, um, you know, playing nicely into some sort of solution is that uh, if you have some sense of what the gameable elements are, like what the gameable features are to a model, um, but ones that are in there, not because you have a good causal story to tell about how they directly influence the outcome, but because they improve your prediction accuracy by capturing associations with other things. And you can distinguish those from factors that are more likely causal. So for instance, if you're building a credit scoring model, um, <clears throat> I might have some factors about your internet browsing behavior uh, that suppose that we're going into kind of more futuristic models where we're not just using financial information, but social media information as well, or browsing behavior. I might have browsing behavior information, um, but that might be entirely associational. I wouldn't necessarily want to provide you with an explanation uh, or <clears throat> transparent insight into how my model behaves so that you just go and go to the sites that would increase your score. Um, but I would want to tell you things such as that, um, you know, decreasing your debt to income ratio, either by improving your income or something else, paying off some credit cards, like that sort of information um, you would want to convey. So there could be some trade-offs to be made in particular in terms of the type of transparency that's provided or what's eligible uh, for transparency. Yeah, so, um, you know, one thing that I think is maybe a little bit under discussed in the transparency world, but is something that I think is really important when we're talking about the sorts of algorithms that are used in, um, you know, government, criminal justice, things like that, sort of transparency into the whole process. Often when people are talking about transparency in the algorithm, it's, it, it's, it more has to do with, um, you know, knowing what the inputs are, knowing how they're combined sort of overlaps with explainability, right? Like being able to understand what's going on to arrive at that, at that final score. Um, one of the examples I was looking into recently, it really caught my attention that we need a lot of transparency into the whole process. So in this one example, I was looking at how a risk assessment tool um, was actually built. So I, you know, got a hold with cooperation of the folks who had built the original tool of the training data set. Um, the whole shebang with, with the idea that I would do this sort of thing where I'm looking for whether there's racial bias, right? And along the process, I wanted to reproduce the final scores that went into it. Um, and again, without slides, this is a little bit difficult, but what I ended up finding was that I couldn't reproduce the final tool using the data that was provided at all. And the reason for this was that um, one government agency had requested requested this this group build the tool they built sort of three different but related tools so you could imagine you could sort of conceptualize this as three different regressions with all the same in with all the same variables in it but each of them have um, different coefficients because of the different ways that they've trained it and then the people who um, sort of commissioned the tool went through and picked from among those three coefficients which one they liked best for each of the for each of the different variables right and so you end up with this sort of internally inconsistent tool and it leaves you with this question of like, why? Like, why did you pick this one instead of this one when there's no sort of documentation of the decision rule? It, it, it just really leaves you feeling like this really could have gone off the rails. And so what I looked into was like, who did these decisions benefit? Let's, let's suppose that what they intended to do was pick this one model, which was the best by some metric. And then let's see how after going through this sort of ad hoc process of just hand selecting whichever coefficients they wanted, how does the 
how does the resulting tool differ from the original, right? Um, and what I ended up finding was that those sort of hand-selected deviations essentially benefited young black men in the sense that it lowered their risk of, um, or the, the rate at which they were placed into the highest risk group. This is again a recidivism prediction tool, so sort of took them out of that highest risk group where they wouldn't have the benefits of, of a program that this tool is used for. Um, and, you know, in theory, that, that might seem like a good thing. This, this was out of New York. And so, you know, maybe, maybe this was trying to do some sort of, his, undo some sort of historical unbias where, undo some sort of historical bias where they believe that, you know, the data as it was overrepresented young black men due to the history of stop and frisk, for example. Um, but at the same time, it really made me think when things are used in the public interest like this or when things are used for government, um, it's not just enough to have transparency in the sense of knowing what the factors are and knowing and knowing um, you know how they're combined to, to arrive at a decision. I think you know that could have gone in a completely different direction and that would be something that people might want to know. So transparency into the whole process I think is, is something that can um, maybe lead to more trust. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I just want to say again, folks can raise their hand or send me questions. I have a couple more questions that folks have sent me. Um, Alex, there was a specific question about child welfare and what does it mean for a child to be placed by the child welfare department? Oh, sorry if I didn't say this clearly enough. Uh, placement means out of home placement. So this is placement into kinship or foster care where kinship would mean that you're placed with, um, you know, a grandparent or an aunt. Um, in other words, removed from the home. And is this a uh, forcible separation or um, that's, that's another clarifying question? Uh, yeah, this is court mandated separation. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, Alex presented a really interesting model on how to get community feedback. I'm wondering if there, so yeah, Kush talked a little bit about getting feedback from diverse stakeholders as well. Wondering if folks have thoughts on different models for how to get uh, either community feedback or in general feedback from diverse stakeholders, um, both in terms of how do you gather the folks that are interested in, in terms of what sort of format to get that feedback. Um, I can start. Um, so I think the biggest thing is just to do it. Uh, I mean, because there, I mean, in, in a company, we talk to clients all the time and they're just, that's not even on their radar screen that they should even be doing it. I mean, they have this data science team. They think that they should just go ahead and um, build the model that makes sense to them. In Christian's example, I mean, they want to just pick their coefficients and kind of be done. So um, I think just starting the conversation is uh, is the most important. And then the mechanics of doing it, I think, the, I mean, I'm not an expert at it, so I don't want to answer there, but uh, I think really, if we can raise awareness that it's an important part of the process, I think that's the, the, the biggest thing that we can do. I would, I would echo what Kush is saying in the sense that it just do it, like it's something that's really important. Um, you know, I think there are some challenges to just doing it. Um, one of those, I think, is in, in criminal justice in particular, is that people often, that the customer is not the impacted person, right? I think when people go for feedback, the customer will be the, the government entity or, you know, police department or whatever that is purchasing the tool or, or, or commissioning the development of some sort of risk tool. And they aren't actually the people who are um, impacted by the ultimate decisions. And so I think there's often the sort of like, conflating of the people who are using the tool with the people who are actually impacted by it with a lot more emphasis put on the people who will be using it. In this case, maybe pretrial services people. I'm obviously only talking about criminal justice here because that's what I've been doing for the last five years, but, um, or judges or decision makers within government, but it's really sort of broadening, you know, broadening who gets a voice in that to be people who are, who are evaluated. Um, by the tool as well. The other thing I would say, I'm involved in one um, one sort of ongoing but stalled um, effort to redesign a risk assessment tool that is attempting to incorporate um, and I hope meaningfully include the voices of people from the communities that are most likely to be impacted by the tool is that we shouldn't be paying them. You know, when I show up to those meetings, like I do it as part of my job. Um, and although no one's paying me like money specifically to be there at that specific moment. It is part of my, like I'm a salaried employee, right? Like my time is covered to be there. And often what ends up happening is the people who are asked to 
um, you know, be the sort of community voice here. It's sort of a volunteer position and it can be a lot of work to get up to speed on what's going on, um, how these sorts of tools are built. This would be like asking any of us to go into a totally different world from what we're used to get all the background information so we can meaningfully defend a position, right? And not being paid. And so I think to have a meaningful community participation, um, we need to pay people. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna try to get a couple of more questions in here. Um, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the, the new sources of data and the automatic nature of machine learning algorithms and specifically what are some of the new issues from machine learning versus more traditional algorithms right, or models? Maybe Kush, we'll start with you. Oh, uh, sure. Um, I mean, one big difference is uh, just the number of features uh, can be much larger. And so uh, the interpretability is uh, much harder to have when you have, um, I mean, a lot of features uh, and those features might not be meaningful to a person uh, looking at them. So I think those are some of the issues um, in terms of new biases. Um, Again, I think there can be less explicit sort of thought put into um, whether that measurement really is reflecting what it's supposed to, um, because you just get a dump of lots of variables and just plug them in and, and just leave it at that. Hey, can I can I jump in here? This is an IR. Yes, go ahead. Hey, a lot of the presentations, by the way, but. I sense that a lot of the material, the examples that the panelists are presenting didn't really deal with large data sets. I know, and, uh, and I'm just wondering whether machine learning algorithms are really applicable there. Are they just traditional methods that are being used? Could you guys uh, expand on that a little bit? Uh, the example that I gave used um, random forest to do the modeling part of it. So um, that was what was specifically used. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about the social justice, criminal justice ex applications. Yeah, so the data sets used to build those models vary in size quite a bit. I think I've seen, you know, I've seen some papers that have built risk assessment models, or at least done the exercise with way fewer variables than I than I would have thought. Um, and there are some more modern ones that use quite a bit of data. And like, I don't know what the threshold exactly is for. Um, big data that you're thinking of, but in some cases it begins by processing millions of records. So, um, you know, it might not end up with that many in, in, in the final tool. And that's part one of the problems with transparency here is I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the models in particular for the risk assessment is usually something like a logistic regression, sometimes with like invert restricted to have integer coefficients. Um, in the predictive policing example, um, it is a, I think it's called ETOS model. It's something that's used for earthquake modeling. And in that case, there can be quite a bit of data. It's, you know, it's going as far back as you'd like um, every um, police record that, that's available. Yeah, the models uh, certainly vary a lot in terms of their complexity. If you're dealing with just structured administrative data, then oftentimes things like regularized regression or random forests uh, will perform as well as anything else. Uh, we're currently starting a project that's uh, looking at incorporating um, free text information from um, caseworker and service provider notes. And so that will obviously require more advanced uh, by statistical standards, more advanced technology. So we're collaborating with natural language processing researchers on that project. Great, yeah. I, I'm wondering if we can get a final comment maybe from you, Alex, about, uh, I think Mani has a really great point in the chat about the choice of the name Nicole in the case study for your talk, Alex, um, how, and how it might have influenced outcomes. Uh, I don't know if you have a quick comment on that before we wrap up. This is a great question. I've never been asked it before. Um, Nicole was not the first name that we went with. Um, initially, the person proposing <clears throat> the, the name suggested the name Asia. Uh, this was a researcher from, uh, from New Zealand. Um, and that is uh, less likely to be perceived as a white name. We went with Nicole because we felt this to be a more racially ambiguous name, particularly with the spelling. Um, there are high profile uh, African-American Nicoles. Um, and also this is a, a common name for uh, white women as well. Um, 
so we certainly did believe at the outset that uh, picking a more ambiguous name um, versus an unambiguously white name or an unambiguously African-American name or Hispanic name could certainly uh, skew the results, but we didn't have the resources to conduct the study with a different choice of name to actually evaluate that. Great, thank you. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for, for coming today and all of, our, of course, our panelists. You had very fascinating talks and comments. I'm really grateful for your time. Um, if you want to continue to be involved in these sorts of forums, I'd encourage you to reach out to us. Our con My contact information um, is available, or you can find my, my name and contact information on the um, on the website. And yeah, as Glenn said, the slides by the speaker will be made available on the website. So we look forward to organizing future panels in this sort of theme of algorithmic fairness. And uh, we hope that you'll continue to be engaged in our, in our panels. Thank you, everyone.